Um, I want to talk now about uh, uh, how I have uh, related to the larger um, academic and intellectual environment that I've been in. As a field worker, um, I'm somewhat immune or I'm somewhat insulated from uh, things that happen uh, on campus or in departments. I go back, I shuttle back and forth between uh, the life of a, of a professor on campus and the life of a field worker. So I, I, have, I can take refuge in ways that other people can't. Still, uh, obviously no one is, uh, is, uh, is able to function in a bubble um, as, a, as an academic. And I'd like to, uh, for essentially for ethno-historical purposes, uh, say a few things about the environments that I've been in as I perceive them and how I've uh, reacted to them. I was a uh, linguistics student, undergraduate at Harvard in uh, the period 1967 to 71. And aside from all the student riots and all that stuff, the tear gas and attacking the uh, the administration and the dean's offices and all this that sort of thing that happened at that time, which was uh, uh, during the, uh, the the Vietnam War protests and what have you. Uh, it was also a period where um, the generativists, under the leadership of Noam Chomsky at MIT, were uh, really taking over, um, uh, if not the world, at least the um, the linguistic environment with in, in the area with ground zero as Cambridge, Massachusetts. So I was right squarely in the, in the middle of uh, what we, of a major uh, a change in, in theoretical paradigms, a period that I, I, I tend to refer to as a high formalism with a lot of very gung-ho um, young people who were uh, rather zealously uh, uh, carrying the uh, uh, the gospel uh, out to the uh, to uh, neighboring places and uh, and departments all over the country, but with a certain geographical concentration in the areas closer to uh, uh, New England uh, as opposed to farther west. In fact, a lot of uh, the people who didn't like what was going on, the including the rebellious. Uh, PhDs from the of the first wave of uh, of linguistics PhDs from MIT who became rebellious. Uh, uh, virtually all of them left the area, and most of them went west to uh, particularly to the west coast of the U.S. and sometimes farther. So there was a westward hoe movement that that people just. Uh, just couldn't handle being in an area where every, where they were uh, uh, domineered by uh, uh, by the uh, the generativists. Uh, I not only uh, got my undergraduate degree there and then went to Chicago, which was sort of a, a neutral place, I suppose, at that point, University of Chicago. Uh, certainly not at the time a generativist place particularly, but uh, then after fi after finishing my my PhD and my fieldwork in Australia, I came back to Harvard uh, for an eight year junior position there as assistant and associate professor. So that's uh, nineteen, I believe seventy seven to nineteen eighty five. So th so by that point the. Uh, uh, the generativists uh, had were completely dominant, uh, and there was really no opposition left, in, uh, especially in uh, in uh, New England. So the the kind of functional thinking um, that I came up with really was to, to a large extent based on the languages I had worked on. It was uh, I, even then I was basically a language buff. And I was more interested in what I could what I could figure out by comparing the languages that I worked on, either field work or just reading, uh, as opposed to what uh, so and so was doing uh, theoretically. I was never terribly involved in a movement, or uh, uh, you know, a clique. 
uh, in my in my department or or elsewhere. I was always a very independent scholar. Now, what I had noticed, uh, having worked myself on an extremely non-configurational language, which is Nungabuyu, uh, in Australia, and also having some knowledge of uh, various American Indian languages, including some field work on Choctaw, also. Um, having an interest in uh, Basque and uh, Arabic and a few other things. So I had, a, I had a kind of an interesting mix of language types that I had worked on. And I became interested in the issue of um, how they keep track of reference. That's the plural of referent uh, going from, um, through a discourse. And uh, I, ha having transcribed texts, I was very interested in that kind of thing, how, how you create coherence through a discourse. And I was especially interested in just the simple matter of how third-person referents are uh, kept track of as you go across sentences or through a, a fairly large discourse. And a, a lot of the languages that I had worked on had some mechanism or other for doing this. For example, there are things like in English like uh, like uh, anaphoric uh, pronouns, so reflexives and reciprocals. We were the there's an, an anaphor and then an antecedent back there that that are co-indexed. So that's a w one way of keeping uh, track of things. So you say. Uh, he hit him and he hit himself. Those are two different things. There are languages with switch reference systems, like like that of Choctaw in Mississippi, which I would worked on. They tell you whether the subject of one clause is the same as the subject of, the, of another clause, of the next clause, usually. Then I had worked on languages like Nungubuyu in Australia, and they didn't seem to have any of that the type of stuff, that syntactic marking uh, of, of co-indexation. They have no anaphoric pronouns outside of verbal derivation. They have an intransitivizing reflexive and an intransitivizing reciprocal, but they don't have anaphoric pronouns. You can't really connect things very widely. And uh, uh, what they did have was an extremely finely chopped up third-person pronominal system. So they had many different third-person categories. Now, they didn't depend on antecedents. They were done each time, each independently for whatever the referent was. But there was masculine, singular, feminine, singular, masculine, dual, uh, 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 feminine, dual, general plural, there were all kinds of non-human categories, or like five or six non-human noun classes and so forth, and uh, the noun classes don't seem to have much of a, the, the non-human ones don't seem to have much coherence semantically. They didn't seem to have much point uh, other than the fact that they could be used uh, to connect words in a, in a sentence or to connect reference um, uh, expressed by nouns to uh, to things that are uh, part of the verbal agreement system, and so all this came together in uh, the idea that there are what, what might now be called functional trade-offs. That you need to have some mechanisms to create a decent level of referential coherence going across uh, predicates, going across utterances within a within a paragraph or, or some other discourse uh, unit. But that you had you had a wide range of choices. There's no one way to do it. There are different ways. To, there are many ways to skin a cat, and each of these had its advantages and its disadvantages. And some of them entailed something else about the uh, linguistic structure that uh, other than other than uh, what they themselves directly uh, consisted of. Incidentally, uh, the the language that best handles this is uh, American Sign Language because there you when you have a new referent you create a space with reference to your body so it might be here or here or here or here or what have you but once you create a space for a referent uh, that space remains uh, something you can go to to indicate that referent later on 
So you have a, 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 cat, a category up here. This is George and this is Mary down here. Then you later on, once you've established them, then you can do a verb and go from there to here. And that's George as subject acting on Mary. Or vice versa, go the other, other direction. You can keep that, that space going for, for uh, indefinitely. Well, spoken languages can't do that. There just is no simple, easy way to... Uh, to keep referring back to the same entity. You, you either use uh, some kind of anaphoric uh, a pronominal, anaphor, ant uh, antecedent relationship, or you have syntactic mechanisms uh, like switch reference or like infinitive versus finite complement or uh, th various things like that, or you have the finely chopped up third-person uh, pronominal category. So I, I wrote a paper about that and uh, submitted it to language. This is 1975. I think I, I think I wrote it in the field, and it was based entirely on the five or six languages that I knew something about or had done field work on. And uh, it had no references, no bibliography, and it got accepted right off the bat. Nowadays, uh, see what happens if you send a manuscript to language or any other uh, prominent journal with, that, with less than three pages of references. See what happens. Anyway, and that paper, by the way, is acquired for that reason. It's acquired a certain cult status um, uh, because I think it was the last paper published in language that had no references other than presidential addresses that, uh, that are, are not uh, are not reviewed and are not held to the same, uh, to, not held to bibliographic uh, standards. Anyway, that was what I thought at the time. I did a paper on anti-passives, the same kind of thing. There, my strategy was to take one. This is Berkeley Linguistics Society, and this and this is to take a a a simple phenom, something that would be have a name for it as a grammatical construction in a language, and that would occur in multiple languages, in this case anti-passive, but which, where it turns out that the thing functions in many different ways, depending on the language. There are all kinds of anti-passives. They they're superficially similar in form, but they, have, they, they radiate out into the grammars of their respective languages and have very different functions. So this is, the, this is another type of article making the same point but from the from a different perspective. So one is the functional requirement, the functional domain, so to speak, and then all the different things that can be done to get there. And the other is to take something that is usually thought of as a, as a single phenomenon, cross linguistically, and show that it really ought to be broken up into many different things, because it belongs to different functional domains uh, depending on the on the language. But the point ultimately is, is is the same thing. So I was thinking along those lines, and this is in this is in uh, the the early mid nineteen uh, seventies. Now I didn't really develop this into a big theoretical uh, paradigm. There were people on the West Coast who were who were much more interested in developing uh, big picture theoretical programs. Um, uh, using somewhat similar ideas, probably quite independently, uh, but uh, people like uh, Talmi Gavon at the University of Oregon was uh, one of the people who uh, made this into a, a, a took the similar ideas and made it into a, a, a sophisticated, uh, high-powered uh, theoretical program, whereas I went on and kept working on individual languages, as is my preference. Now, um, to take a couple of other examples, uh, something like uh, coordination, um, you know, X and Y. Well, that's something that sounds like it's a, a unitary phenomenon that occurs in, uh, in all languages, but um, again, if you, if you take something like that and you look at it in languages like Nungubuyu, which don't have any phrasal structure, you look at it in uh, a range of other languages, you can see that how it works really depends on the, on the, the linguistic context of it. For example, uh, a lot of languages don't use coordination for, for sentences. Uh, they use it for noun phrases, but not for sentences like we do in English. Well, uh, a, a typological study of that would observe that. You'd 
people who work on 20 different languages and they would testify and you'd discover that there are languages where it occurs only with noun phrases. Uh, in that case, it might really be a with uh, a, a marker in, as opposed to, to an and marker in some abstract logical way, as, uh, whereas and would be something that would be a, a, a better uh, name for something that also happens to sentences. But uh, you you don't really get the the reason for it unless you go into the into the whole the larger picture in the in those in those languages. So coordination is like antipassive to me is something that really should be broken up. It really should always be studied as part of a network of grammatical phenomena that are different from one language to another, rather than as a unitary phenomenon. And this is my major complaint with uh, typology, as it is linguistic typology, as it is currently practiced and has been practiced since uh, the time of Joseph Greenberg, who basically established the uh, the methodology that's that has been used. Now, typology has at times tried to find big picture distinctions among languages. Uh, the three that I that come to mind are constituent order, uh, head independent marking, and ergativity. So take those in order. What Greenberg tried to do, uh, and, and some other people tried to do, was to take, in particular, the difference between object verb or OV and verb object VO order and to see if that could be, um, if, if that would turn out to be a, a kind of master typological principle that would drag in a lot of other stuff. So that if you knew whether a language is VO or OV, you would either know or have a pretty good idea about lots of other things that are correlated with that. Well, uh, Greenberg tried very hard uh, to, to, uh, to, to do uh, word order universals. Unfortunately, a lot of those have turned out not to be very strong. And uh, that effort is kind of dissolved. It's, it's no longer really thought of as, as, uh, as, a, as, a, as a terribly crucial uh, d distinction. There are a lot of languages that where you can't predict noun, noun adjective order, you can't predict ad position order from the verb object or object verb. There are a lot of languages where the order is even a verb and object is variable or non-existent, and uh, it just it just never really panned out as a as a as a fundamental way of organizing language types. Similarly, um, had independent marking. Well, if languages were cleanly head, head marking or cleanly dependent marking, uh, then that would be a really uh, strong result. Uh, it doesn't really turn out that way. There are languages where verbs are, are uh, head marking and nouns are dependent marking or what have you. A lot of languages which don't really fit either category or they have a lot of both. And so it, it really doesn't uh, doesn't uh, work out very well. Incidentally, I've I've shown that one Songhai language be has become heavily uh, head marking in a in a relatively recent uh, in the relatively recent past. So it's it's not an, an immutable, long lasting uh, 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 categorization. And as for ergativity, there was a time in the in the 70s when some people thought that. Uh, maybe languages can be divided into nominative, accusative, and ergative, absolutive as syntactic, not just superficial case marking, but syntactic, kind of deep uh, distinction, which would have to be binary. It, there's no, it wouldn't be any way to be in between. You either, whether it was done in terms of tree structures or something else, it, it had to be, it had to be fundamental and very deep. And so people were excited about that for a while, but it turned out that the, uh, the supposedly ergative syntactic languages weren't so clean after all, and uh, that idea also is not uh, is, is still still around. There's still some people who uh, who, who who are interested in the in the idea, but it hasn't really lived up to its promise. Now there is one 
distinction that really is binary and really is crucial in the sense that it affects everything in the language, uh, but that's been totally disregarded by everybody, by formalists and functionalists, and that's non-configurationality. Non real, true, or radical non-configurationality means there are, no there are no phrases, there are no clauses, they're just uh, juxtapositions of words. And uh, uh, that's something that affects everything. For example, it, it affects quantification. You can't use quantifiers if you, can't, if you don't have noun phrases. You can't have adjectives versus nouns if you don't have noun phrases. Um, you can't have structural case marking for subjects and objects if there's no syntactic relationships between verbs and arguments and so forth and so and so on. There, it has tremendous ramifications for the lexicon for everything. Now why hasn't this uh, caught on? Well it's partly because uh, a lot of people just don't want to believe that there, there is such a thing as, as radical non-configurationality. And another problem is that there are only a handful of languages, maybe fewer than five uh, in the world, that count as, as radically non-configurational. Uh, one is Nungubuyu, which I worked on. There are probably a couple of other languages in the, in the same area that could be described as radically non-configurational. And that's about it. There, there may not be more than one or two that have been described. And so not many people are going to be interested in a typology where there's a split between you know, a couple of Australian languages on the one hand and everything else. Uh, because every other language has at least some configurationality. They may have fluid word order, constituent order, but they've got some kind of uh, structural case marking, subjects and objects. Uh, they have noun phrases with some internal structure and so forth. So it's a couple of languages versus everything else. So uh, typology really is never, unless it, it gets interested in, in non-configurationality, it's never really going to have a, a big picture where you have master principles that have lots of ramifications and lots, lots, of, in, lots of entailments. Now let me give, so what has happened in, in typology Whereas the, the, the generativists are interested in complete syntactic structures and how you build phrases and how you build clauses and even multi-clause constructions, uh, typologists have become more and more focused on low-level phenomena. The things that, uh, that uh, are easily, uh, seemingly easy to define cross-linguistically, which, which create little compartments in each language, grammatical compartments, where there's a few things going on so that you can study those few things and compare them with the few things that are going on in all the other languages that have the same compartment. So coordination is uh, one example of that. Um, another would be uh, things like imperatives, and another would be things like uh, reflexives, anaphoric uh, pronominals. Now I mention imperatives and reflexives because there's a lot of typology about each of those separately. However, there's nothing to speak of uh, in terms of comparing what, how those two combine or interact within their separate languages from one language to the next. And uh, recently I, was in, I did a co-authored paper with uh, Vadim Djachkov on imperatives and hortatives on the one hand and their interactions with uh, with uh, reflexives on the other, especially reflexive objects. And we couldn't find a single paper or a page in book length uh, descriptions of either imperatives or reflexives. There was just no interest in the way they connect. And to me, that, that became emblematic of the difference between a grammarian, which is what I am, and a typologist, which is what most, which is what large numbers of people who, who are, uh, uh, are inclined in a general way to, toward functionalism or away from formalism are. Uh, because the, the critical thing in grammars is how these things interact. 
It's just like phonology. Uh, the, in the interesting thing isn't what the features are, it's what happens when you put them together. What happens when you put words together or morphemes together that uh, uh, require some kind of transformation to make them uh, pronounceable or to make them fit the standards of the language. Well, likewise, uh, think about it, imperatives and reflexive, especially reflexive objects, the issue is do the, do the subjects of imperatives, if that's the right word for them, do they uh, bind reflexive object anaphors the same way that subjects do in indicative sentences? And uh, you know we've we've been taught for uh, for many decades that one of the th interesting things about English is that you say "kill yourself." Uh, we don't say "kill you" uh, as an imperative, and that means that there has to be a hidden second person subject, uh, even though it doesn't normally appear on the surface, but it has to be there virtually because it's the antecedent that binds the reflexive. Well, in the, in the Dogon languages that we worked on, um, that is systematically not the case. Uh, again, you have imperatives that are simple, uh, simple forms of the verb, as in English. You have the absence of um, particularly a second person singular uh, subject. There is no overt uh, subject marking in, in, uh, in singular imperatives. And lo and behold, they have reflexive uh, object forms, in fact, very highly grammaticalized and, applied and applicable to all persons. So like Latin say, uh, for example, where, where it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not just limited to, uh, to a particular uh, uh, a category of subject, but a general... Uh, uh, so, or rather, Russian sa would be a better example. So it's I, uh, I hit myself. That would be I hit sa, you hit sa, he hit sa. So it's the it's just a, a transpersonal, uh, very highly grammaticalized uh, reflexive uh, form in Russian, and that is the the case in Dogon. You have that in indicatives but not an imperative. So in, in Dogon, you would say as a statement, you hit yourself yesterday, but as an imperative, you'd say hit you with the regular second person object form, not the, not the, uh, the reflexes. It's very systematic. Uh, we found that with, multiple, with all the Dogon languages that have a grammaticalized transpersonal reflexive form, uh, either object or possessor, we find this works systematically, uh, that those languages do not have. Now, we looked around for, in the typological literature to see if anybody's discovered something like that, and we can't, with just radio silence. Nobody is interested, they might be interested in, on, on one day in reflexive and another day in imperatives, uh, but the connection doesn't uh, doesn't come up in in typologically think. That's why, as a grammarian, uh, I I cannot endorse the the methodology of um, of, um, of, uh, of of typology.